Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 13 of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey everyone, in these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, mainly because we cut them out after we say them, but we'll be discussing (laughs) them in further detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. And the truth comes out. (laughs) (laughs) And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan. The in-episode dates were May 14th and 15th, as well as August 3rd of 10 years ago. The writer was Greg Weissman. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits uh, this week include Tom Adcox as Clarion. Usman Ally as Halid Nasur. Erica Ishii as Mary Bromfeld and Child. David Kay as Vandal Savage. Vanessa Marshall as Black Canary. Kevin Michael Richardson as Nabu and Charlie Daggett. Deborah Strang as Granny Goodness. Lauren Tom as 13 and Penny Randall. Hayden Walsh as Perdita Vladek. And last but not least, D.B. Woodside as Phantom Stranger. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode begins in Sydney, Australia, where Vandal Savage arrives by boom tube to recruit Phantom Stranger to end all of this conflict on the planet Earth once and for all. After the credits, we pick up right where last week's episode left off in the North Pole, where Clarion has just arrived on the scene as a bus. At Zatanna's insistence, Dr. Fate reluctantly agrees to team up with Clarion to defeat Child, and everyone climbs aboard the magic school bus to find Clarion a new familiar. And meanwhile, over in Hollywood, Queen Perdita has just arrived at the premiere building for a surprise visit with Garfield, who doesn't seem too happy to see her. In the middle of an apocalypse. <laughs> I think this contrast is very funny. Back on the school bus that's hurtling through time and space, the magic team continues to not trust Clarion as far as they can magically teleport him, throw him. And the group eventually arrives at the spookiest animal shelter he could possibly find. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Lightning, thunder, the storms, everything. Meanwhile, Phantom Stranger has summoned the lords of both chaos and order because that's something he can do so that Vandal Savage can reason with them and plead humanity's case, arguing that he is the one who maintains the balance of order on Earth and that child has upset that balance unnecessarily. In response, chaos and order argue that Savage's alliance with Darkseid is what has truly made the Earth the central point for so much conflict and that any destruction child causes is actually Vandal's fault. Hashtag Vandal did nothing wrong. I don't know. Back in Salem, a strangely familiar looking stray kitten walks out of the rain and adopts Clarion. And once Clarion has a newly minted Teakle, the group heads back to the ruins of the Tower of Fate for the final confrontation. With Zatanna and the magic scouts hidden by an invisibility spell, Clarion summons Child for none other than an epic boss battle. Despite Zatanna orchestrating her protégés and the group throwing everything they have at Child, she proves to be too powerful for all of them. Meanwhile, Vandal Savage continues to plead with order and chaos, arguing that if the Earth is weakened and Darkseid wins, the final fated confrontation between worlds, war worlds, then the anti-life equation will be released and both chaos and order will cease to exist. So, for the long-term good and the, of the holy balance between the two, <laughs> they need to stop Child now. The Lords agree to the proposal. Chaos withdraws their additional power and support from Child but refuse to remove her entirely so that the world can balance itself however it will. Back at the Tower of Fate, the fight continues, and despite Child's lessened power levels, the magic team still continues to struggle, with Mary even getting desperate enough to start draining power from every living thing around them. Meanwhile, back in Hollywood, Perdita realizes how withdrawn and self-destructed Garfield has become because he is having a time, as we say, He's quit Space Trek, quit The Outsiders, he's started self-medicating, ignoring his friends, and has been quietly ghosting her for months. And when he refuses to get help or let her help him, she breaks up with him and leaves. And I support her decisions. (laughs) 
Back in Salem, the fight is going really badly until 13 notices the small crack in Flaw's design and uses her bad luck magic to make that Flaw expand until Flaw, the creature, shatters into rubble, (laughs) destroying Child's anchor on the mortal plane and banishing her back to the Lords of Chaos. Which, with Child finally defeated, Clarion leaves with Tikal, and in the aftermath of the battles, Tatana proposes an idea that Naboo alternates host bodies between herself, Zatara, Tracy, and Holid. A plan which would allow Dr. Fate to continue his fight for order, while also keeping each magic user strong and healthy, and allowing all of them to continue living their lives outside of the role of Dr. Fate. However, Zatanna has specifically excluded Mary from this arrangement, believing that she's too attracted to power and too irresponsible with how she acquires it to be trusted with the full strength of the helmet and Naboo's not always humane influence that comes with it. Mary's angry for having been left out and storms off, teleporting to Fawcett City. While Naboo agrees to Zatanna's plan, Zatara initially refuses since he made his sacrifice to protect his daughter from the helmet in the first place, but Zatanna convinces him and Holland and Tracy both agree to the plan as well. To allow Zatanna and Zatara some time together and to allow Tracy the chance to tell her own family about this new arrangement, Holland chooses to be the first one to become Dr. Fate. And after Holland puts on the helmet, we see Phantom Stranger has, yep, has relayed his interactions with Vandal Savage to Naboo and confirms that the catalyst that tipped the scales of chaos and order and set the whole arc into motion was Zatanna having the idea to share the helmet for the first time back in episode nine. A little while later, we see the magic users back in Salem to set the magic school bus right to rights. <laughs> Rah, to rights. Uh, Zatanna gives everyone Black Canary's number in case they need someone to talk to about all of this. And Dr. Fate sends them back in time to just after Clarion took the bus 10 years ago. But not before Zatanna magically connects with the bus to see everything it went through, including Connor's ghost screaming for help as the bus hurtled past. During the credits, we see Black Canary counseling Zatara and revealing that she's been in contact with everyone on the bus for the last 10 years. And told no one. (laughs) (laughs) And remember, stay through the credits, because after the credits, we see a dejected-looking Mary curled up in an alleyway while the disembodied voice of Granny Goodness plays on all of her fear and rage and insecurities, convincing her that the other heroes who don't actually have her best interest at heart and eventually pushing her to finally, tearfully say, Shazam! And re-embrace the full power of Sergeant. For which I am sure there will be no negative repercussions whatsoever. Aster. Many thoughts on this episode. (laughs) There's something going on. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. All right. Uh, Where do I want to start? This bus... Actually, I'm going to start with uh, Neil. I I read one of your notes, so when I was rereading, when I was rewatching it today, I was actually looking at it. You were talking about the the fate HUD, yeah, <laughs> the fate GPS HUD, uh, the I don't know universal HUD, universal G U G at U G U G S. Well, so so my note is basically first and foremost. Why is he back in the driver's seat? That doesn't seem like it's required. I, mean, <laughs> right. I guess it's, I guess it's I his mean, spot. It, yeah, That's it's his most comfortable. Charlie but he's still it's using the only adult the, size full seat. Of the bus, he's still using the steering wheel. Uh, <laughs> but the fact that like Clarion <laughs> is the bus, and you're guided by this like heads up display from Doctor Fate, and then he's just driving it like you normally would. Yeah. So. I looked at the, the you were saying like what are the what are the like away their waypoints the nav points on this map they all look like red tr- red diamonds to me I think it's like well this Lord of Chaos is here and this Lord of Chaos, take a left at the uh, nebula and uh, head straight to that Lord of Chaos uh, yeah no it totally looks like Lord of Chaos waypoints to me yeah well I mean as you're traveling clearly nothing is off limits so the idea that you could go to a place with a Lord of Chaos is reasonable I mean we were sure. in, I mean we're at the source wall inside cyborg supposedly at a planet I still don't know <laughs> right <laughs> yeah there are no rules no no rules for this bus that's for sure yeah 10 years it makes me think back like what did they I mean, they only had glimpses, bits and pieces of the last 10 years. 
So they don't know when anything happened because they didn't even go to different places in chronological order. No. So they would have said like, hey, yeah, there was something about a giant plant. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of like what they would have possibly revealed to Black Canary that, I mean, I don't think she could have used much or any of that information until retrospect. Like, oh, this is what Charlie was saying about a giant plant. Oh, that makes sense now. Or right? like, you know, if they told her, hey, there's going to be a giant plant attack uh, on this bridge in Metropolis or whatever. And then when the whole thing point. started happening with all of the plants and she's like, oh, we should send somebody to Metropolis because there will be a problem on a bridge. <laughs> Let's tell Bruce so he can randomly and strangely have a bomb filled with defoliation gas or whatever he had in that episode. <laughs> Let's make sure he's got that prepped and ready to go. I can't yeah, tell you I how he already did. With that, already, with that, with that, we're well, jumping yeah, around a little right. bit. But with that scene of Black Canary explaining all that, this this time through rewatching the episode, I did laugh a little bit at her describing uh, whatever the kids told her about Zatanna as impossibly adult. Yes, <laughs> I just think that's a very <laughs> funny description. Being like, this is the <laughs> the person they described, and only knowing fourteen year old Zatanna, I can only describe this as impossibly adult possibly version adult. of your daughter. Yeah. Well, if you have, the interaction we see in this episode is really the most consistent experience they've had so far. Also, I guess I hadn't thought of it this way. It's also weirder thinking about it now that all the times we have seen it, Clarion was the bus. You mean in all the episodes where the bus was in danger in the yeah. previous seasons? Just thinking of the idea that, oh, look, there's Clarion. Yeah, the idea of like <laughs> reverse engineering, not anything now, but like thinking back that every time the bus was there, it was Clarion as the bus. The thing that gets me is like, so yeah, so there's like the scene where guys got the bus mm-hmm. in like a big catcher's mitt, right? Well, I mean, the neck in, in the him skipping, nope, 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 right? Did Guy not see a giant red teleportation circle just suck the bus away? <laughs> Probably. Like seconds, seconds later. If if there's, any, if there's something? any Green Lantern that's not going to notice. Oh, it's... yeah. You know what? You're not wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong. Problem He's going to be like, that was weird. All right. Time to get on with business. Because Black Canary does see it teleport away at one point and would presumably mm-hmm. have gotten already been given the information of like, hey, this is a thing. Did did she? Yeah, because She's, there's one. Point oh, there's, there's the one scene that's uh-huh. not in an episode. In the same way that if Guy would have brought it up, if she caught wind of it, she could say, "Hey, no, just it, don't worry about it." It's Everyone's all like, everything. What does Black Canary know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll pan, it'll pan out. It'll, it'll, it'll all be fine. Yeah. The worst that the, the kid that I feel the worst for on that bus is poor Penny. That poor kid had to pee for like two hours. And she just could not get off that bus. What a nightmare. And then she's like, I got to go to the bathroom really bad. What does Zatanna say? We're going to get you back home. We promise. She's like, <laughs> I, just, I, I don't care. Can you like get to a, get to an off ramp? <laughs> off ramp, please. So you brought it up. So the conservation, conservation of characters. Once again, here we Teen go. Titans number two, DC comics from <laughs> April of 1966. <laughs> The teen, the Teen Titans receive an emergency call from Smedel, Smedleyville. <laughs> they discover a 16-year-old Penny Randall and her friend Garn, as well as a caveman, attacking the people of the city. And that is her one and only appearance in DC Comics. Wait, Pat, I didn't quite follow. I don't know if there were any commas in that sentence. So is Penny attacking the city? No, so Penny calls the Teen Titans from Smedleyville because her and her friend, <laughs> there's a caveman that is attacking the city. A caveman. I, like a normal-sized caveman. So he's attacking the city like with a club and hitting a building? Uh, I mean, the on the cover, he is. there's like a string of Teen Titans holding onto a tree, and the other end, the caveman, is yanking Robin's leg. So I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> Come on, Neil. What's the plot summary of this that that comic? <laughs> I'll look. I'll look into it and I'll report back. But yes, I'm also very disappointed you didn't report that in 1920s radio voice. Oh no, yes. Well, this is the 60s. So. <laughs> oh shoot. Okay. That Completely different sense. radio voice. Dang it. Okay. 
Wow. Okay. Well done. What about Charlie? Is he a bus driver in anything? No, I couldn't find anything on Charlie. Oh, but. okay. That's fair. That's fair. And four years setting up this joke. Wild. Anyway, so magic school bus. Tickle. Tickle's just back, I guess. I got notes. I love Tickle. I I feel genuinely very bad for Clarion, and I feel like this is just like it's the weird okay, Rich is giving me this look, and I have I've talked about this before. It's the thing of like comparing Clarion and Child in this arc and everything. Of Clarion has a weird energy of having like Clarion doesn't have limits, but at the same time, Clarion feels like he has limits compared to Child. Like Clarion does actually care about certain things and just and doesn't actually want to destroy the whole planet. Okay. Uh yeah. Um, and also, I I will point this out about myself. I'm trash. I love cats. You can tell <laughs> me that cat is evil all you want. She's precious, and it's not her fault. I love T. Te- I love Tickle. I'm not going to argue with your love for Tickle. I don't. I don't. Not going to judge you for that. Clarion. I do like Clarion more than Child. Yes. And I'm trying to figure I'm out. I'm not why. saying Clarion's good. I'm not saying Clarion is a good guy. I'm not saying Clarion yeah. needs a redemption arc. I'm no. not saying any <laughs> no. of that. I'm saying <laughs> no. that when Clarion <laughs> says that he lost Tickle, who's his best friend, I'm like. I feel bad for this evil bus possessing creature of darkness. I feel a little bad yes. for him because I, I like I, that I, cat and he also I, likes that cat. I also did for a moment. Yeah. And then just, I'm thinking, yeah, just for Clarin a brief doesn't moment. Want, Clarin doesn't want to destroy the world. I think you're right. But that's he gets because two points. He, <laughs> he gets all of the playthings to do terrible things to. So uh, he gets a he gets a point for protecting the earth and negative 10 million for of course of course okay great all right we're on the same page then i think yeah speaking of teagle i also just have a note here that just says the cat distribution system works even for lords of chaos because i do like the idea that rich did you just give me a look about what the cat distribution system is yeah i don't know what this is the cat distribution system is a phrase coined by the internet for the fact that uh most people who have cats did not go out looking for a cat a cat found them Ah. see peaches the cat that my in-laws just kind of started feeding one day and then kind of let into their house and now just keep in their house all the time see all of the cats my family has had uh during my lifetime who all simply wandered into our life and now live here um (laughs) see most stories of the internet of people being like so the thing people joke about, about how most people who have dogs have a whole story about like how they went to a shelter and had to go through a lot of different like tests and finding out if they were right for this animal and going through a foster program and having right. their house evaluated and everything. And then people who have cats are like, I found this gremlin in the trash and now it's mine. <laughs> right. Don't feed it after midnight. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I got it now. The cat distribution system works once again, even for Lords of Chaos. I wanted, I really wanted Teekel to be that that hairless, though. <laughs> but the fact that Teekel looks exactly the same gives to me the idea that Teekel just gets <laughs> reincarnated. Like, yeah, of course, I, who of knows course how is. many Teekels Clarion has had? But in my brain, they are all still somehow like the same cat that just keeps regenerating. <laughs> I saw it. would be like. I love this. This is like this existential conversation before she gets reincarnated. Okay, so we're going to reincarnate you. You're going to look exactly the same. Uh, where would you like to manifest? Do you have any idea? Yes. <laughs> the Salem Pet Cemetery Adoption Facility. Only during a storm, please. <laughs> that's. I'm pretty sure that's where he's going to go. Okay, great. We'll send you there. <laughs> so, like, speaking of which, I also have a note here about this of, like, I like the detail that they find uh, Tikal in Salem because we've already previously established that like Salem is an actual magical hub in the YJTC universe. So it makes sense. It's a fun little detail. But just also, this is the spookiest animal shelter next to a graveyard surrounded by dead trees because this is this is May in Salem. I just want to point this out because I couldn't (laughs) stop thinking about this. It's May. Like... (laughs) <laughs> it's 
it's not actually that cold <laughs> in New England in May. Yeah. Like, yeah. so those That's trees fun. are just dead. <laughs> or, yeah. or it's the thing of how everyone assumes that Salem, Massachusetts lives in perpetual October. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it was a gardening choice. That's all. It's a <laughs> Dale, did you just say, choice. oh, yeah, like oh, that's yeah. 100% of the time? <laughs> There's a little ex- special pocket that just exists full October yeah. at all times. That's how I assume y- y'all on the on the West Coast think about New England. <laughs> I, well, and I, 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 I surfed everywhere I go, but yes. in California. But I, I think what's even more interesting is I don't necessarily, I mean, I guess I would have to really rewatch super closely but when i watched i didn't feel like it was a graveyard next to i it just looked like a graveyard a part of like yeah it just there were like no pet fence cemetery like, you man. just walk over there and there you are there's just pet you're cemetery. in it that's right okay yeah are you ready <laughs> are you ready for another d- a deep dive that right, i don't do think it. has any actual relation 1920s radio voice almost i just before we move on i just have to send out this plea into the universe that i am once again asking warner brothers to make a teakle plushie please she's a very oh. cute little evil cat and she deserves to be a tiny stuffed animal she's so cute <laughs> i would i would give money to to <laughs> a company for this cat plush that that plushie's coming alive no. in your house i'm just saying no. animating I just I, uh, have like a little, little plastic crystal collar. And it's got yeah. little, little cute little embroidered markings. She's a cute little evil cat. She doesn't do anything bad on her own. She just wants to chill. Uh, <laughs> That's true. Now, Neil, That's true. please give us a deep dive. I give just need to dive. again Save us, put Neil. that okay. thought into the universe. So, again, I don't know that this has any direct connection, but it's close enough that we got to talk about it. So there's we have Clary and the Witch Boy. One of the other ones was Salem, the Witch Girl, who was the sidekick to Dr. Fate back in like the Justice Society days and had a cat familiar named Midnight. So like a lot of the parallels are there close uh, enough. I have never heard of this. You got me. Got yeah, me so, on this one. <clears throat> let's see what the came back in like 2023 where there was like kind of like this new new golden age. So some of those characters came back. So like that's the more recent version. But at the same time, the first appearance would have been in 1940. Uh, so, yeah, if you just another random character that I thought was, 1940. It was <laughs> it was closely connected, but again, I don't actually think there it's there. It's just we were at a pet cemetery seeming place, and it was in Salem, and that sparked sparked interest, and I found and I found that character. Wow, maybe, maybe okay. she owns gotcha. the maybe she owns the <clears throat> animal shelter. <laughs> yeah, it's the pet cemetery. <laughs> yeah, it was like the house to secrets. <laughs> yeah, it's all connected. Yeah, that's funny. All right, well, what else do you got? Beast Boy, he's having a good episode. Yeah, yeah, he's good. Hashtag Beast Boy's great. So yeah, here are my, here's some Beast Boy notes. So yes, we all know that Beast Boy's having a time. He's not going well, but his deadpan response of, yeah, that's not going away anytime soon to a <laughs> volcano <laughs> appearing in <laughs> Sydney is yeah. kind of perfect. He was great, yeah. Yeah, that's just like now a fact of life in the Young Justice universe that there's a volcano yeah. in the middle of Sydney. Like, I don't think they that's, can fix that, uh, at least not for a while. So that's, that's going to leave a mark. There. <laughs> that's going to leave a mark. Right well, there. the giant <laughs> pillar of fire that popped up in the middle of an uh, ice cap. <laughs> yep. So right. Yeah. And then everybody's just like, we are just trying to make sure that we save as many people as possible. Yep. We can't fix some of this. <laughs> <laughs> We're the other one that just let a bunch of demons out. Uh, I also I also have I have many notes on Queen Perdita because, as I have said before, Queen Perdita might honestly be like my favorite minor character on this show. Oh, 100 percent. The fact that her her showing up and Beast Boy automatically asking, are you here for a shopping spree or an economic conference? I'm like, Queen Perdita has her life more together than mine will ever be. And I (laughs) admire her so much. I want to be Queen Perdita when I grow up. Yeah. I also love how frustrated her bodyguard seems about the whole thing. 
Like, no lines, but the facial expressions is like, this is stupid, and I don't like that we're doing this. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's been here the he's been here the whole time and has been seeing Queen Perdita trying to text her boyfriend for months mm-hmm. who isn't responding and just, he is on her side. Uh, but that's my assumption. But speaking of other stuff, I do want to say shout out to Dao Hong, the lead character designer for season four. And that is who I assume is responsible for the thing that I very much love about Queen Perdita's appearance here, which is that she now has a prominent scar as a result of her heart surgery in season one which is one of those things that i had never thought of to question before but the second it was on screen i was like of of course of course that was missing of course that is the perfect addition to her design why didn't i think of this before (laughs) it's a really cool detail it completes her look it's very nice it shows an evolution of design that i very much like and appreciate about her also like this that this breakup scene is so painful to watch because the whole time you're just like, oh, boy, buddy, she is bidding hard for your attention, bidding hard to be there for you. Like mm, you get zero points, zero points for any of this. And she has a hundred percent healthy response on her part. Done my best. I'm out. Because it's like, it's not even that she just wants his attention. It's not like Queen Perdita showed up and was like, why have you been ignoring me for four months or whatever? It's, she's showing exactly. up and is trying literally every tactic to be like, hi, I know everything sucks and I am going to do every single thing that I can think of to try to help. And at every turn, he's like, no, he just shuts down and won't engage with her. Like, yeah, she is showing up and being the literally like the most fantastic partner here of being like, hi, I've gotten you your favorite food. I am willing to talk. I am willing to not talk. I am willing to listen to you. I am just checking in and making sure you're okay. I literally don't care what we do right now. Oh, I can see that you're struggling. You should get help. You won't get help. Can I get you help? No. Okay. This is not going anywhere in a much slower version because doing it as rapid fire as that would actually be bad. And yeah, of course. Yeah, it's just it's so it is heartbreaking, but it is also so frustrating watching that and being like, yeah, no, she's completely right of being like just trying to reach out to him and being and knowing him well enough to know that none of his current behavior is normal, like compared to some people who have kind of been like, well, Garfield's struggling and I guess this is just Garfield having a bad time. And Perdita's like, no, no, it's not. This is worse than that. <laughs> yeah. And like, and it's just all the stuff of like her actively be willing to be like, no, I will s- stay with you because I love you as long as we actively work to make sure that you are not literally destroying yourself right now. And like, that is her only condition is, hey, let's stop self-destructing intentionally. And he's like, no, leave. Let me insult you and violate every boundary you've set up. And I'm like, yeah, no, break up with that boy. <laughs> no. Yeah. Lines drawn out the door. <sighs> because, again, I have so much sympathy for Beast Boy, who, as we have said, is going through a time here. And I get yeah. it. He is. There is a reason he's self-destructing and he does need to get some help. But it's like the fact that he is so unwilling to get help or acknowledge yeah. that he is struggling is what is frustrating. Because mental health problems can explain problematic behavior, but they can't justify it. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the re- reasons your your step in the 12 step program is to apologize. You know, it's the, at no point are you justifying those actions. Uh, you're going back and trying to make amends for those actions uh, during that time. So, yeah. Yeah. And for her. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's not like she doesn't have anything going on. So yeah. <laughs> um, I, I the emotional maturity to say, hey, I've gone very above and beyond to try and do the most I can at this point, I have to draw the line to protect myself. Yeah. On a lighter note, what is that crosshair symbol? I still don't know. Dear listener, if you know, please tell me. It's the Outsiders logo. That's the Outsiders logo? Yeah. No. It shows up in a couple of things as like, I think it shows, I think in season three, it shows up on like 
like their in-universe social media page or something like that. And you're like, oh, oh that's so supposed to be it. the Outsiders okay. logo. And then like Beast Boy starts getting shirts with it and stuff. Well, yeah, and he has like a like a image of it in the background and it's on a, one of the shirts and then, okay. I believe that's what that I is thought, supposed but... to be like the Outsiders team logo okay. for all intents and purposes. I accept this answer. Okay. So most of my other notes here revolve around the proposal for how we're dealing with Dr. Fate, which is going to definitely be a whole thing. I have several notes here. So, Neil, (laughs) if you got more to add on things that aren't that, I will put a pin in (laughs) a whole thing. Here we go. Let's start closing some tabs. All right. So in the first scene, (laughs) we have both Ice and Isis show up. Really interesting, especially because like they... They're clearly important, but then don't have voice acting lines. Uh, so Ice, according to Ask Greg number 26225, formerly known as Ice Spike, as well as Ice Maiden, joined the Justice League in Team Year 7 as Ice, at which point she was 20. We'll follow that up with... Oh, no, that doesn't help us. I'm not <laughs> much engineering that much math. I'm out. Um, but yeah, I mean... What's the problem? It doesn't make it. it. I thought it made more sense. So basically, um, on, on July 3rd of Team Year 8 was when like there was a really big introduction of more people to the Justice League. Aquaman, aka oh, Calderon as Aquaman, Batwoman, Fire, Hardware, and Ice were all um, inducted into the League at the same time. So which, you know, tracks with the whole idea that there's a big voting and then either we let a bunch of people in or we don't. Um, so, yeah, that was the, the class of... What about ISIS? <clears throat> what more do we know about ISIS? Because we know she showed up She showed up as a spirit form that Zatanna had, like, channeled. But, like, do we know no, that's anything it. more? No, no, no. So that, that original and this scene, well, that's it. Ooh, they just got her on retainer, man. Yeah, that and crashing the mode, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we see them here to kind of allow for modes to be crashed. But yeah, in terms of in, yeah, in terms of the overall, this is basically it. Uh, no voice, no voice acting. But Isis is really, really, really interesting. Uh, just like the dev- development of that character and potentially like what version is even in Young Justice, especially with long even more modes to be crashed but her her story is based around a lot uh from the Shazam from Shazam and being more directly connected and married to Black Adam at one point um and then you have i mean we were alluded to the original Shazam show but the secondary show was The Secrets of Isis yep. um that also came out around the same time and so that's another another and this back. was the this is the live action from the seventies. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Seventies. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it had two seasons, and then had like a short comic run after that, and so that was like kind of that was actually the first iteration of the character, and then when they revamped it, that's when uh, she married Black Adam and kind of went down down that redo of her story. Interesting. What else you got, Neil? Any sixteens? No, I mean in terms of the spells, it's always interesting to like. When the spells happen, what I often do is like I'll watch and then I'll put the close captioning on to see because it's kind of just this fun little game of I wonder what they're going to say today because uh, sometimes it's just like talking in gibberish or or different things. Speaks a foreign language. Yeah, that, that yeah. one comes up a lot. <laughs> so the one this time around, though, so you have like, again, the ones that have happened before we kind of won't go over glamour, hide the sentinels. So then that's the the one where they're they're all invisible. And literally she just says Dinah's card uh when when she basically summons surprise Dinah's card. But when she touched the bus and said show me their journey, it's written backwards. Like if you're watching the closed captioning, it shows up yeah. like perfectly written. Uh whereas the other ones don't. Um so yeah, it's always interesting. So to strange see. to me. It's just a dice roll. Well, yeah, because I mean, and I know Greg's Greg did a lot of work to try and get that because I my assumption would then be like whoever's getting and able to or doing the closed captioning is probably provided a script and that they would be in there. But then, you know, I don't you know, 
too much of a reveal. So then you try and pull that back. Um, yeah. But the other one was uh, 13 using just straight up Latin. And luckily for us, I have a Latin translator because why not? Um, so we have Vidium Incremento, where basically it's fault, a vice, crime, sin, or defect, growth, development, increase. So those are kind oh, of nice. words. So defect, increase, defect, growth. Um, but yeah, so you're basic. You're, you know, I mean, who doesn't speak Latin? But I know the power of Latin. Yeah. So then that's that's what you have. Just what you don't want to do is take Latin and say it backwards because that gets way out of control. Super powerful. Yeah. Oh, only I found that funny, I guess. <laughs> no. <laughs> we were too scared. We believed you, Rich. Are you right? <laughs> I would end one saying backwards, and then what happens? I don't know. I bounce off the call. So speaking of calls, one, I, how is Granny Goodness talking to her? I don't know. I don't but know either. That is the exact place that Billy was in, in the exact alley that he was in in Misplaced. Right? Yeah. Isn't that, yep. uh, yeah. It was and Misplaced so, where we, we yeah, wouldn't so recognize him. <laughs> yeah. So that's back in Fawcett City, which is you know key to billy and mary and is act is in theory is named after wilford h fawcett the founder of fawcett publications and the original publisher of captain marvel and billy batson's character yeah the interesting thing though is like because when you do a background depending on how static it is and like this scene you know sometimes it's a little easier to tell like this is clearly like a static background with animation put over the top of it but what really stood out to me, because I go back and I kind of watched the two scenes at the same time, is the overall lack of definition on the new video game cabinets compared to the old video game cabinets. In the sense that, like, I feel like if I was, I could kind of guess maybe at which games were previously being, like, eluded to. And in the new version, I cannot. It is just blue or, you know, more of a solid color. Whereas, like, the other one, it's like, maybe if I squint hard enough, I can say, I think that's Galaga. Right. I say it in that way to say, it's also extremely not definitive. But it seems like someone decided it was definitive enough that we shouldn't do that a second time. <laughs> the new version is just, like, just blue or just black. No anything on the cabinets. Other than that, though, like, it is identical, the two scenes. Interesting. Um, I was just thinking, every time we talk about every time we talk about Shazam or any of the Marvel family and stuff like that, I have to like make a shout out to Chris Newton who came on to talk that two part episode where he goes a deep dive into Captain Marvel and his history and the Fawcett City comics and the whole like legal things with the uh, Captain Marvel versus Marvel Comics versus is Shazam a too close a knockoff of Superman and we're going to sue you the whole legal battles and then all of just the mythological history and what are his powers and how do they use them? It's a great episode. So a discussion session. So if you want, you can either go into our reprints episodes where we uh, took a holiday off and we did uh, some reprint com- uh, compilations of some of uh, some of our discussion sessions. You can just check reprints with Shazam or Chris Newton. And go check that out if you want to know even more about Shazam and his background. What else, Neil? Um, I mean, your 16th are a couple timestamps in the end of uh, Dinah's number, of course, is one starts with 555 and ends with 16. Yeah. But other th- other than that, um, I think that's about it. And we're see. not allowed to know what her area code is. Uh. <laughs> the, only, the only thing that I, I had to, had to do with the bus again which was, are we assuming that because it went through a whole bunch of times or something? Like, first of all, okay, so Clarion can go through time. That's the thing. Second of all, fate just sends them back in time 10 years. So I'm like, okay, there's some timey wiminess to be discussed. Like, so the bus went through time and did a bunch of stuff. Cool. Fate reads like, the chronotons or whatever you want to call it that are stuck to the bus and then reverse engineers it back to its original starting point. Okay. Can fate go through time or is it just that? Is it just that he's re- And then one way or the other Clarion just like, Hey, I need a hero. I'm going to go jump all the way through time 
<laughs> for 10 years all over the place. Is that why Zatara is so old? What? No, I mean, just like uh, conceptually, maybe. like, so, so let's, let's say, yes, fate can travel through time and you have the body of Zatara. And the reason he seems so old is because he is so old because he's traveling and spending time. extra time in time somewhere else. That's possible. Because fate seems like a jerk and that, that would be totally reasonable. I think Zatara still refers to. But Zatar still says like ten years. Ten, like ten years. That's like, true. He doesn't be like, actually, it was five hundred years. Like he does it like Yeah. But I mean, like, so so Kent, I mean, he stopped wearing the helmet and then he lived to a hundred and six, a hundred and eight, something like that. Something like that. But where's Zatar Zatar's been in there ten years and he looks like he's gained thirty. And I, I get that he's tired. But like somehow the helmet helped to extend, I think, you know, Kent's life. But it's actually Reckon. Zatar. I mean, oh, we've talked about this before. It doesn't even let him sleep. Yeah, but if you're you're extending Kent's life because Kent's not using the helm, but still connected to the power of Naboo, the opposite is true that you're connected to Zatara and constantly using him up because he's has the fate. He, he is fate. He's not him. He's not himself. Yeah. And I mean, I'm assuming the same thing happens because, you know, we're talking about like Zatara and others were talking about like, I can't just bring about world peace. Like it, it's drawing my life force to do this stuff. Like how it even says it, right? It's tapping into her Vitae, you know? And so if he's just continually just using him up, you know, but anyway, <clears throat> back to time. Like once you, once you start, once you start messing with time, stuff once you start saying this is a thing that can happen it starts bringing up questions i mean he was just a diamond flying through what was it what did you write so is it flaming i'm just a diamond, diamond for... hurtling through time and space <laughs> time yeah. and space we i need a hero okay yeah and then he just pops up in back in time i don't know anyway i'd like to i'd like to understand a little bit more about that well, speaking of the bus, I think that is the most prime example of what would it be like for Zatanna to have a conversation while inside the Helmet of Fate? And because it's, she's like, <laughs> you know you're inside me. Oh, I know. I'm glad you're listening. I wouldn't say all these things if I thought you couldn't hear me, sir. <laughs> Zatanna is perpetually full of rage, and I love it about yeah. her. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's let's get into that bit, too. Because there's a few things to say about Ooh, yeah. the Zatanna situation. What you got, Emily? Start us off. I got I got so many things about this scene. Like this scene is like th- three minutes of the episode or whatever, but it's so much happens and there's so much to talk about. You're talking about at the end scene when they're like resolving everything about fate? Yeah, just all of the stuff about fate and Zatanna's plan and everything. So let's start. I think these my notes are kind of in chronological order. So I will go from there and we will jump around as we see fit. So we finally in this bit, we find out Zatanna's whole plan of everybody sharing the helmet of fate and this whole thing. And we start all of that off with her telling Mary that she is not part of it. And the fact that the first thing we hear from Mary is her saying, why are they getting rewarded and I'm not, is so telling about like the state yep. of things that Mary truly does not understand the scope of what Zatanna is proposing. And like as this scene goes on, we'll see that kind of nobody really understands the scope of what Zatanna's proposing, even if they think they do. And we'll get into it. But like the fact that that is Mary's reaction of like Zatanna is being like, you're just not ready. This isn't a punishment. You're just not ready for this thing. I would love for you to be ready, yeah. but I am making the responsible choice to say that this is not a thing you should do because it would not be good for you. And Mary is just like, nope, this is a punishment. And now I'm mad. Yeah. Zatanna, Zatanna please see exhibit A through Z. All of the <laughs> dead wildlife just next to us. Yeah. That would have been fine. Probably had you not chose to just rip the power out of the ground and everyone around you. Yep. And going off of that, there's the thing that comes up a little later in all this where when Holland is like, 
can I speak to you for a minute? And like goes after Zatanna for a bit. And I get that yeah. there is some t- some things to discuss about whether or not Zatanna's plan is ethical and good. And we will get into it. But hearing that thing with Holid and like rewatching this episode so many times to write about it. Like the thing that struck me recently was how he's like, I can't believe that you you let Mary do what she did and now you're penalizing her for it. And I'm like, in what world did Zatanna let Mary do anything? Like we see what Zatanna has Mary do, which is a very specific, we would like you to channel and absorb child's fire tornado. That is what yeah. Zatanna assigns to Mary. And then Mary makes the choice to be like, what if I kill everything in a two mile radius, including almost killing my friends? And Zatanna is meanwhile desperately trying to make sure that everybody doesn't light on fire because it is raining (laughs) fire. And everyone's like, Zatanna, how could you let Mary do that? And I'm like, Zatanna's not responsible for that, actually. Well, even to layer it on, Tracy's like, Zatanna, stop her. She's like, I can't. She's sucking out all my energy. <laughs> Tracy's yeah. like, Zatanna, you need to stop her. And Zatanna is simultaneously holding a shield above everyone and desperately trying not to pass out. People are like, why aren't you doing more, though? And I'm like, she's yeah. dying. Leave her be. Well, I mean, based on how Flaw deals with Mary, Tracy just needed to pick up a rock. And just throw it at her, <laughs> and it would have been fine. Yeah. But no, you know, or bad luck. Yeah, I feel like there were so many. They're not even clues. There's just so much evidence to the contrary. Um, you know, before we kind of discussed the overall discussion surrounding the idea of, I don't even want to say it this way, but the idea that some people had that Zatanna was like a bad mentor. Right. And it's just like, first off, she is doesn't even justify Holland's question with a response because to her, that is how ridiculous the question in fact is to then say, no, but look, I, okay. You think I need to have this conversation? I'm not going to respond to you. And I'm going to go have that conversation in earshot of you because it's not like I'm not doing this. Look, it's the best of intentions, but I don't know if you saw not one, but two Lords of Chaos were involved causing multiple volcanoes and just destroying everything we know. So what? Yeah. And it's like, I think that scene, like that one specifically that you're talking about where Holland is like, did you only have protégés so that we could do and that she just doesn't say anything and walks away? I think some people watching this for the first time and then writing their think pieces about it on the internet interpreted that as her being like you're right and i don't want to say that out loud because i'm embarrassed so i'm gonna walk away but the more times you watch it and the more you hear the actual canon answer of when she found decided on this idea that is stated in this episode um yeah not not minutes later yeah yeah it's very clear that like that look on her face is i will not dignify that with a response and she just goes over and goes i am going to address the actual problem and i will talk to tracy about this and make it clear that she can do whatever she wants and it's the thing of like standing up to your mentors and calling them out on being wrong is a core ingredient of the dna of this show like get on board or get out of the way has been a a yeah. piece of young justice <laughs> formula since episode one but seeing it in this moment it's like okay i get where you're coming from and i get why you're mad and i get that you don't have the narrative omniscience that we will get from phantom stranger in a minute but like you're wrong and you're very wrong. And Zatanna is trying to as calmly as possible be like, no, no, n- no. <laughs> and like, yeah, it's what's it- wild. What's interesting to me is <clears throat> like, so she says to Holland, I didn't even have a chance to talk to you about this. Yes. Right. Yeah. And she, so, and then also implying Tracy as well. Right. So she talked to Mary about it first. Mm-mm. Well, she no. went to we, well, you well, when be, she when she walks away from Tracy and Holland, they there's like a brief line between them that is basically kind of like whoa. Yeah, to it's the, a to little something. unclear because he does yeah. like there is the so she talks to them first and then walks but, over to Mary. But no, I don't think that's how it 
I, we have to go check it again. But I don't think that's how it went because she she was like, hey, Mary, great job. I need to talk to you. And they're like, what? Like that she did a great job. That's the way I read it. Oh, but then it was Mary. There was Mary who was saying like they get rewarded and I don't. And the conversation with Holid came after Mary. Yes. Because she says, I didn't get a chance to talk to you. And Holid said, oh, no, I'm in. You know that I'm going to be in. But you allowed Mary to do all this stuff and now you're punishing her. I'm like, I'm a little confused about like, did she end up? Because that conversation with Mary, we don't get any of it. We just get the end. And with that, and with the fact that she says, like, because she does say, I'm sorry, I didn't even have the chance to ask if you, and then Holid cuts her off. So we don't quite know what she's going to say, but I have always assumed it's her being like, I didn't even have a chance to run this by you and Tracy before we all started shouting at Dr. Fate. But like, right. seeing that and remembering that and remembering that this whole arc takes place on one day. And we do get yeah. confirmation from Phantom Stranger that the moment that Zatanna thought of this idea was literally in episode nine when she's like, wow, you're all my best students. And her brain went, wait, what if? And came up with a whole plan. And like the thing that I think people forget, especially when people forget that that is in canon, the canon explanation for when she decided to do this as an idea, Zatanna, like this whole thing gets out of control for Z- for Zatanna so fast. Like, of course she messes yeah. up the conversation with Mary. And of course she messes up this conversation a little bit with everybody because she thought of this idea like less than 24 hours ago and has had zero time to plan or rehearse. And it's just kind of like, hello, this is step one of brainstorming. Here's my wild plan. And everyone's like, time to exactly. agree or walk away. And it's like, <laughs> because everything explodes. Like if nothing, if nothing, except there, we hadn't had the volcano in Australia and Sydney, right? Like we hadn't had all this stuff, then maybe she would have thought about it for a week or two. And thought, hmm, maybe I should, and I'll talk to them about it and say, what do you guys think about this? And it could have taken a more natural path, but instead it was rushed pretty quickly yeah. toward the end. But like, yeah, I'm interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm going to need to rewatch it again and see like what the order of operations was there for how those conversations went. Well, one of the other things I think of is like, I, because I did rewatch a bit of it but the idea that like i don't think she wanted to talk to dr fate without having talked to her dad this is just you know headcanon the idea that like even having like spinning that uh, i don't know the timeline of when she would next see her father for that hour but let us say that like that seems like a plan that she could come up with to say hey i'm gonna keep working with you all and the next time I have that opportunity, I need to have that discussion with him. But it's just Mary shouting, no, you're going to tell everybody right now. I don't like your answer. So you're talking to fate. And you're talking to everybody. Yeah, she did say that. She was like, why don't you ask him and see what he thinks? But I'm just like, I mean, we talked about this, I think, last episode where she's like, man, Mary, do not put that helmet on because that helmet's not coming off. Shazam's the first thing he's going to say. <laughs> and you've got. And you've got Egyptians and and Greek gods everywhere, like wrecking whatever needs to be done. E. The more times I rewatch this episode, and like this whole scene is the thing that we keep coming back to in this episode because there is so much going on and there are so many layers. But like rewatching it and thinking about the conversation that like Holid has with Satana and how. I said that Mary doesn't understand the scope of what Zatanna is asking. I think Holid thinks he understands the scope of what Zatanna is asking, but still kind of doesn't. Because, like, he in the same sentence almost says, like, the helmet of fate is a prison. And also, you're penalizing Mary for not letting her participate in being part of the helmet of fate prison. And I'm like, you can't hold both of those thoughts. Like, those are... Th- that is not the same thing. Like it's well, human beings can hold a lot of, of course, opposing thoughts. Yes. Of course, <laughs> I yes. realized that Let's as I said that, that straight. But I mean, like it's the thing of like <laughs> but, yes. I feel like in this scene, only on a level, there's a level of like only Zatanna and Zatara actually get the full scope of like how much of a responsibility and a sacrifice this thing is. Like 
I can get yeah. Holland thinking that like this is a sacrifice that I am honored to make because of my family history and to protect the world. And that's fine. But like you have to understand that it is a sacrifice and that yeah. being excluded from that is not a punishment for Mary. And even though she thinks it is, and it is being made because she is a whole bag of disaster, like <laughs> <laughs> it's also to protect her long enough that she can grow and be able to do something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm so riled up about this scene. No, no, I get it. I get it. And at what you're saying, like, he does he really get it himself? Like, because he's done being a doctor. You can't you can't just keep doing medical school or get a job as a doctor somewhere and just be gone a week out of every month. So, like, he's done he's done doing that, which kind of sucks for him. Right. So it's, yeah, he could it's have a, a private practice. He could be uh, the doctor. It, I don't heroes. think he's graduated yet. He has. He he's still in medical school. He's still a student. He's done, right? He can you can't... get out. He he can make it work, but he's got to get out first. Yeah, he's got to. Yeah, he could make it work. Yeah, I mean, but like he can't. He can't do that. So even the one week out of the out of the month is actually worse for him. It's like you might as well just be Doctor Fate or be a doctor. Like it's one or the other. Right now, it's like you get three weeks out of the month to do what? To do what now? It's you like... know, like can you pull that off somehow? I'm not quite sure. You know, and then Tracy, that's rough, man. And her dad, I don't know how they're doing her dad and in in, uh, in the show, but like, I don't think her dad's really happy about any of the things that are going on. He's certainly not going to be happy about her putting on the helmet of fate. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, she can make her own decisions, but like, yeah, I don't know. And fly through space and time. Yeah. Initiate canary debrief. Stick around. Class is in session. I mean, one of the things I think about now is like there are aspects of Zatanna being a mentor that can be questioned as to like, was that the best version? Yeah. Which is something you could do with every mentor yeah. protege relationship without question. What I would say is the positive that is being grossly misinterpreted by the characters in universe is her trust in them. Because the only way a good mentor can create a good protege is to trust them enough to fail and to then be there to catch them. I, yeah. I think about like, so my wife is, is becoming a neonatal nurse practitioner. She's doing her clinicals and there's one and I've liked him for as long as I've known him. Cause we've known him for many years, but he said, no, right now is the time for you to try and fail because I am here and I will not let you fail completely. Right. If you don't try and fail now and you go and try and fail later without this mentor-protege relationship, right. things can be very, very bad. So yeah. now is the time that you need to learn, which I think is the same aspect of, hey, you're not doing this. You're doing that. I need to trust you to even find where those failure points are to work up from. Yeah. Um, the same with Holland of like, no, I'm going to trust you to do magic your own way. And I'm here for advice and a sounding board. And the same with Mary. I was like, I have to trust you to see, <laughs> to see if you'll fail. So yeah. Communication is a little bit of an issue. Yeah. Okay. Sure. But her ability to, which that's a, I mean, that's a hard skill. You can learn to communicate better, but like being able to just innately trust the people that are beneath you, that's a soft skill and that's way harder to obtain. Yeah. And also, again, again, with the it's been 24 hours since she was thinking, oh, I wonder if this is an idea yeah. to contemplate. Oh, no. And now we're having this conversation and I buses guess and volcanoes. Oh, my. <laughs> Conclude. Canary debrief. And also, I had to throw this out there. And one of you may feel free to correct me if I am remembering this wrong. But I think at this point in the series, is Zatanna... The only, like, main magical hero on the Justice League? Besides Fate? Yes, besides Fate, who doesn't count because he's a helmet and not always fully a person who could mentor you children. You don't count because you're a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> like, because uh, like, other than Fate, yes. 
Yeah, the only true magical because we've never seen Constantine, Etrigan, and all and of they're that not is on the league, not on its own. Blue Devil is the magical version, but still is just is the Den Mother. It's not it's just like a dude. magic magic. Yeah, like he's a he's a guy with powers that are magical, but I wouldn't consider him, him a like magic a sorcerer, user. Uh, like yeah. a homo magi kind of thing. Yeah, I think you're right. So then it kind of to me plays into the thing that I think about a lot with Zatanna of like the idea that she became the default adult that the team and the league kind of handed magic kids to. And she's yeah. a 24 year old orphan who's basically self taught on a lot of levels and just kept getting handed magic kids who all are different yeah. skills and different skill levels and different backgrounds and was like, keep them all in check, figure out how they get better. And I'm like, that's so much <laughs> to hand a person. And like, I know I'm making some assumptions, but I feel like that's there a little bit of like, if she is the only one who can do that thing and the kind of structure of the team and league is like, I guess we call in Zatanna to help the magic kids. Cause we're not going to call in Dr. Fate. Cause. <laughs> well, especially the count, the counter to that, the, the rogues gallery of magic, on the opposite side is strong. Yes. Wotan, the wizard. Um, yeah. They were the three that popped up behind Zatara in the previous episode. And that yeah. doesn't represent all of them. And Clarion called in four in season one to help him split the world in half, which means there have probably only been adding to that pantheon of magic bad guys. Is it Blackbriar, Blackbriar Thorn, Felix Faust? Definitely not calling on him. Right. And then <laughs> the wizard man. showed up to help. And the Wotan wizard. wasn't. Yeah. I mean, if you think like going back to like ISIS, but again, I don't know that she she might be on the league, but then like what is she truly magical? Xanadu, but that's more that's not a league member. That's yeah. She may be in fact the like one true magic user on the league right now. Yeah. I think you I think yeah, you're making assumptions. We have to make assumptions, we just don't have the data. Yes. But I mean it's seems like pretty fair That's my head cannon a process it's a pretty fair path to go down right and and since she was 14 to when she's 24 who else was teaching her stuff it was all herself right <laughs> Like, Unless somebody's giving her gills, like I don't know where else she's gonna go. Yeah, that's exactly it. The only place she could go to would be, you know, Mara or like, I, I don't know. I don't know where anybody else learns. And even that is like again, that's a different magic than what her magic is. Like all of the magic schools <laughs> are kind of different in Young Justice. Like they don't use the backward spells in Atlantis. No. They just yeah, Jason Blood, Jason Blood stuff. wouldn't. Constantine's just a wheeler and a dealer. Like, yeah. Yeah, so no. Constantine I, I, would be your closest of like, hey, I bashed my head against the wall until I figured it out. Would you like to join me in that? <laughs> like, that's like the closest. <laughs> I like, guess yeah, the closest you have. That's why I got Constantine head cannons for Young Justice, but that's a whole separate yeah. bag of cannons. <laughs> so I, I guess like our takeaway here is we feel like there's a lot of ways to look at this thing with with Zatanna. It's been 24 hours. She had a brief thought about a, something that might work. The the world almost literally went to hell in a handbasket for 24 hours involving every every person that could possibly be involved on superheroes across the world. And then in 24 hours this conversation came up. She made the right decision about Mary. Right. Yeah. And I think it's a reasonable decision to talk to Khalid and Tracy about this plan. All of that seems very reasonable. It doesn't seem manipulative. Right. right. It seems like she's she's just kind of I had this idea and I wanted to talk it out with you guys. And then circumstances completely got out of control and make a decision. Right. It, it, you can make a decision to do this or not do this. So we all feel like. Yeah. I don't know like reasonable about her choices in this episode, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh yeah. If you, I mean the other, the other thing you have to think about is most of the inciting events for the actions that she chooses to take in this arc are exponentially above the pay grade of almost every superhero that we've ever seen on this show. Yeah. It absolutely. is at the point that it is the, the Lords of order and chaos making choices that are then impacting the characters that we know and love. Like that's, 
You had a thought, and then they were just like, oh, yeah, boom. Here's here's a different diamond flying through space and time that just showed up. It's like, oh, okay. And then they're making volcanoes and buses and stuff. So, yeah, I think she did a great job. That's what I'll say. Considering the circumstances, I think I think we all agree. I just got to say, on a final light note, not necessarily. Uh, the, that final scene with Black Canary and Zatara, when she's talking about how she's still in contact with everybody from the bus, the line that gets me every time is, Penny graduates college next week. She's an engineer, wants to build safer bridges. Right. Safer bridges. It <laughs> makes me want to cry every single time. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so good. He's it's so good. So-and-so moved, or uh, Charlie moved to the, the other city. Still driving that bus, though. <laughs> still Greatest dri- man I ever met. It's so good. Uh, it's so good. Yeah. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Crash the Mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four. And Crash the Mode will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. Hey. We've got some stuff down here, but I have a question for Neil. You said cr- you said crash in the mode like six times earlier when we were talking about ISIS and some other stuff. So they pull so they pull ISIS to get together in the Tower of Fate to start to do things. So like I really do think that the introduction of ISIS here is to establish her ability as a magic user yeah. to then be leveraged before. Because I really do think that that scene would have been very very odd to just have ISIS show up and be in the mix. Whereas here, because the only reason ICE shows up is because Isis uses what is now, in hindsight, a very similar vibe to Dr. Fate's teleportation. Like, when he does it, the onk shows up, and then you walk through to the place you want right. to go. Whereas yeah. they walk through her scarab <laughs> to show up where they want to be. So I think the yeah. whole, like, one of the real big reasons of having them show up is to introduce that character as a powerful magic user so that when they're all in the Tower of Fate together around the bell, then it all makes way more sense. Exactly. And and it comes into like, because, you know, you, you pull someone in. I mean, we could be like, oh, yeah, she was from the comics and she was from the 70s. But in the show itself, uh, you run a danger of something like that feeling like a deus ex machina where you just like, oh, we're just going to create a new character who can solve all these problems. And here we go. Right. And you at least introduce her, you know, into the scene so that it doesn't hopefully feel like that way. Yeah. Well, and you have it narratively makes sense of like, well, you can teleport someone. It's, you know, are they in the Arctic? But you took the person with ice powers to the ice place. Like it all makes, (laughs) it all makes justice league (laughs) sense. Okay. Like that's, yeah, we have a problem. Who checks that box? You do. Ice is in the name. Let's go. Uh, We got a, we got a giant pillar of fire um, flying up through the ice. Yeah. I have, what I think is a crashing the mode question in turn. Do we feel like Mary in the guy, not like in Shazam mode. I don't know of another way to say that (laughs) would be powerful enough to take over the helm. Or do we just feel like Naboo is strong enough that no one could do that? Cause that would be my actual fear is like you're, you're embodying six gods the power of six gods an entire pantheon at your back is there a chance that you can take this i don't think that i I think it would obviously stem out into like a a cascading effect of things that would happen because of the law the lords of order and chaos but yeah in my head that would just be a constant fight for control i feel like that would be a literal mini series of watching all of that take place inside the helmets yeah. and you know out in the world with the i think it's possible that maybe yeah that also for me raises the question of like would she even need to like that's the thing of like would dr fate mm. just be like yeah no our our decisions Let's are go. aligned we are both ready to just do whatever and wreck a bad guy you don't need to take control. We are just agreeing to be on the same side right now. It would depend on what Mary was trying to do, I think, of how difficult that battle would be. And also, the helmet is cracked right now, and we don't really know what that means, and we never really figured oh. it out in this arc. You're not wrong. It gets into the philosophical question, too, like, okay, so whoever's got the helmet of fate on is in the backseat. 
Yes. Or lo- or locked in the trunk. <laughs> however you want to <laughs> look at it. Right? It. <laughs> right. We just watched Ragnarok and I been Bruce Banner is just like, I don't know, this time it felt like Hulk had the wheel and I was locked in the trunk. <laughs> and I was just like, they keep sticking with me. Right. But like, so we already know that that's a thing, right? Well, then it becomes this philosophical question. I think Chris Noon and I were talking about this idea of different interpretations of Shazam or Mary or is Mary, does Mary go away and this new person shows up that's Sergeant or does Mary like, is Mary still a part? Does she still have a hand on the wheel? And it seems like in Young Justice because, because Billy remembers everything that happens, you know, like. What do you mean, Wally? Do I got to give you nachos to get you to like me or whatever? Like he knows what was happening. So it seems like he's still present and older, right? And uh, and in the Justice League animated, it's the same too, where he's laughing at comics and stuff like a 10-year-old, right? Would laugh at a comic, but he's also still got all these powers. So it seems like they merge them together. But there's a possibility of like, if Mary gets shoved into the back seat when sergeant shows up and then you put the helmet on her and she turns into sergeant like whose psyche is how many psyches are involved i guess that's what i'm saying so i i think the implication in young justice of how the shazam powers work is that mary is still mary she is just infinitely more powerful and whatnot like i agree because they do they reference that as like you weren't living your life as Mary, you were living your life as sergeant. Like you were right. like it's the way it's kind of talked about feels very much like an like an altered state, like an addictive altered state of like you are living with the thrill of being powerful rather than living at your baseline you rather than it being like I feel like if it was, yeah, no, you're just not present, you're just backseat letting somebody else drive, that would not be the same level as like addictive draw to power that it is described as in the series agreed 100 percent. yeah excellent point which is the black adam version where like black adam is always that way like the whole like there are storylines where he basically gets cast out like light years away and just you know fist forward flies back and then the whole crux is tricking him into saying shazam because then his original body just ages out into dust because he's been alive for thousands and thousands of years um always as black adam never going back to their original form yeah also what happens if mary puts on the helmet and then says shazam or does she have to say shazam and then put the helmet on (laughs) What's the order of operations here, guys? In D D, it's like, do I take the do I take the portable hole and stick it in the bag of holding, or do I take the bag of holding and stick it in the portable? Which one destroys the universe? It's fine. I don't it's remember. Fine. Yeah, you have, the, you have the collapsing arrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think it's I don't know. I think it's a fascinating thought experiment. Um, what what did you guys have for crashing the mode? Hey, yo, have I have we maybe mentioned that Connor's not dead yet? Whoa, oh, yeah. we don't yeah. know. But we did a great job <laughs> by not saying where he was. I was actually very surprised. This <laughs> it's the thing of like writing those outline that everything outside of crashing the mode is written within like the truth of the show as it has been described to us right. so far. So uh-huh. so up until crashing the mode, Connor's a ghost and Zatanna saw him. And into crashing the mode, Connor's trapped in an alternate realm right now. <laughs> in the fa- in the phantom zone. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, it will be key that it is maintained that it is that he is a ghost, because that is how people will operate moving forward, that he is a ghost that can be found, which is wild, honestly, that for a for a stretch of time in the show, everybody's like, we need to literally bring Connor back from the dead. I mean, so. This goes all the way back to season one. Yes. Was Secret a ghost? I mean, like, yes. The assumption moving forward is is yes. Has it, so then you've had direct first hand <laughs> interaction true. with a ghost before. It's not a leap then at that point to be like, wow, yeah. I think he's a ghost. I do think it's the funny thing is Zatanna's like, I can't bring back, like, season three is like, Zatanna's like, I can't bring people back from the dead. I can't call a ghost on purpose, kind of thing. I'm like, then what happened with Secret? And Zatanna's like, I don't know. That was just a really weird thing that happened when we were teenagers. Yeah. There was that sword. I don't know. Yeah. And I think, yep. at least at this point, 
correct me if I'm wrong, I may be kind of misremembering exactly what the plan for Connor is going forward until we find out he's in the Phantom Zone. Like, I feel like right now Zatanna's thing is like, Connor is not at rest. We need to figure out how to get Connor at rest. I don't know if it is explicitly that Zatanna's me like, okay, time to go to the underworld and bring back Connor. But it's just, it's just a little wild. <laughs> Ghost Connor. Yeah, I don't know if there's like a larger plan, but definitely the plan that gets moved forward is, okay, I've seen his ghost. Where was this bus? Let's try and reverse engineer. Where is his ghost? And just, I, it yeah. feels a little like remembering it. Like there wasn't really a plan beyond like, find Connor, move forward. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's step that's one, the plan I as I interpreted it. Like Zatanna's step one was find Connor. And everyone's like, okay, what's step two? And she's like, We'll figure it out when we get there. I'm not making any plans until we are at the theme park. Like, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's gonna gonna be a big thing going forward. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot. Neil, what else? You uh, have? I mean, speaking of, yeah, Gar's still having one heck of a time, but um, <laughs> yeah, and that's not gonna fix itself Mess. for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, just like that volcano, <laughs> that's not gonna fix it. Just like the volcano, that's gonna leave a mark. And it is the thing of like Garfield still has quite a bit of bit of time to still get through, though I do think it is so it's and that whole subplot in this episode is very well done and very sad and very heartbreaking. But it does occasionally like strike me when watching this episode of like there is literally an apocalypse going on and like Beast Boy in Hollywood is like nothing is wrong. (laughs) It's like such a weird state to be in, which again Shows how he is oh, wow. absolutely yeah, going through a time. Yeah, his his whole personal life, he's just like, my life is, not, not, all of this tracks. <laughs> this is. <laughs> to yeah. still say no when Superman and Black Lightning are having a con- conversation about the, like, basically the Justice League reserves. To still say no when clearly they're hard up enough to call the wizard to show up who is, like, not a good guy. Yeah. But to stay, and then clearly the outsiders are doing their part. Your den mother is out there fighting demons, but still in the face of what is clearly an apocalyptic level event, I'm just going to sit here on my phone. And he's still got some steps to get through before he is anywhere near recovered. And I know that when these episodes were coming out, some people didn't like the fact that this was such an arc for Garfield and that this took uh, almost the whole season and that it was a thing that they kept coming back to in every single mini arc and everything. But part of me feels like if they hadn't done any of this, the complaints would be to the exact same degree in the opposite direction of being like, why doesn't Beast Boy have trauma? Why aren't we talking about Beast Boy's PTSD? Like, or if they'd done it a couple of episodes and then waited the whole season and then did something at the very end, it's like, Hey, you know, it doesn't it doesn't resolve that quickly. Yeah. Like you got to you got to work at some stuff. So it's the thing of do I get why people were like, this is a very long arc uh, when I when to like when there's other characters I want to see. But at the same time, the more I rewatch it, the more I kind of appreciate how much Beast Boy is going through, even though we do joke about like Beast Boy's having a time. Yeah. and Why isn't any adult intervening? It's also like, yeah, that's how stuff is sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Neil, do you have any other crash in the mood? Uh, nope. I can leave us on the idea that while we do know what Penny and um, Charlie are doing, I have so many questions about the rest of these kids, these poor, poor kids who tra- traveled through space time and everything in between, saw the source wall, uh, was inside Cyborg's <laughs> blood, was <laughs> taken over. But in the entirety of that experience was also taken over by a – uh magical witch boy uh who also you have to think like okay it's been hours but it's been hours of jumping through space and time and the phantom zone and everything in between for just hours yeah uh, yeah Those literally points. screaming and then taking a breath and then screaming and then taking a breath <laughs> and screaming some more i also just gotta say i just remembered in all of this discussion we never explicitly said what's up with mary that mary's gonna end up on it's not called an apocalypse that's what it is let me say oh yeah we Uh in all of this 
we've talked about Mary, but we haven't talked about the actual crashing the mode thing with Mary, which is that she's going to end up on Apocalypse and joining Granny Goodness's Furies team. And uh, that's going to be the... With? With Supergirl. Um, because that's what that team needed. <laughs> Yeah, they were they were seeming relatively underpowered at the time. So, yeah, just you know, throw in Supergirl and Mary Marvel. She had a she had a good day on LinkedIn, <laughs> and uh, and then picked up a couple of good candidates there. You know what I'm saying? Just had some open casting and was like, oh wow, we found yeah. the two perfect oh, candidates. Excellent, nice. Yeah, just add those Wonderful. to the roster. Um, yeah. yeah. Just we just had to actually because the thing was we were all operating with that knowledge of just forgetting to say it. We're like, yeah, there's some stuff that's gonna happen with Mary. I'm like, we never said what that stuff is. I also wondered when this happened in this episode, I also wondered like because she didn't she didn't like go to Apocalypse and say sh- say Shazam. She yeah. was in Fawcett City and said Shazam. I suspect she would go and try to take care of some business. <laughs> like before she left, like, hey, I'm really upset about all of this. And now I can do something about <gasps> oh, it. No. I'm like, ooh, ooh, I don't, ooh. We'll see. Though, I will say, I think one thing that is very interesting, especially on rewatching that scene, is how the decision that Mary isn't even angry by the time she gets to Fawcett City, she is just dejected and feeling so Sad. bad about yeah. herself so that crushed. like like the anger is probably not gone it's still there but like it's burned itself out to the point that she's like i just need to sit on the ground and cry which is a very specific emotion mm-hmm. and it's it makes that scene so much more heartbreaking in a way like and she and she like whispers yeah. She's saying, yeah. like, she doesn't say it like, I'm taking ownership. And she's like, she's yeah, just, like, it's very much that thing of like feeling like, so bad about herself that she's like, I need the one thing that makes me feel good about myself. That is this addictive power that she has tried to cut out of her life. I would couple that with the idea that it's the one thing she can control when she feels like that she has lost all yeah. control. Because I can justify the emotion, but like the idea that she's not part of the Sentinels anymore, yeah. that she's not. And but that, that's not what Zatanna said. It's not that you're kicked off the team. It's like this thing that we're going to do, that can't be for you right now. Yeah. Like that's just not, it doesn't work right now. And But yeah, the idea of being able to control something by saying a single word. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, then with all that, I think we can say it out of the Watchtower. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay well. Stay well, everyone. Well, everyone. Everybody. Have, you go slower. I go faster. We have, I go faster. We have you go slower. never <laughs> once agreed on what the cadence of that is. Um. No. <laughs> awesome. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.